changes everything. Come on, somebody say, this changes everything. This changes everything. This changes everything. All right. Hey, it's so good to be here. My name is Elliot. For, for those of you who don't know me, I see a lot of new faces in the room. I'm so glad that you are here. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Can we give it up for our first-time guests right now? Come on. Hey, if you're just brand new here, we, we are so glad that you're here. I don't want to embarrass you or make you feel like under the gun or anything. I just want to let you know that you're so appreciated and and. Pretty much everything we do is, is so that we can, we can share God's love and share God's message with you today. And so I pray that is exactly what happens. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 1. Matthew 1, it is Christmas after all. Come on, somebody. Let's talk about Christmas finally. Yeah. Let's talk about Christmas finally. So if you got your paper Bible, turn in that thing, blow the dust off of it. And turn it over to Matthew 1. Come on, somebody. And also, if you've got a smartphone with you, you can also get in the YouVersion Bible app. And you can follow along with these scriptures in the YouVersion Bible app by clicking events and then finding Lifeline Church. And what do you know? Boo -doo -doo -doo. You've got all of our notes. You've got all the scriptures. And they're also going to be up on the screens. And they're also going to be in your bulletins. Man, there's so many ways. There's so many ways to follow along. But hey, let's get started now because you know what? I'm fired up. Oh, I'm fired up. I'm ready to preach today. I've got something for you today. I'm so pumped up about it. Yeah, yeah, you'd be excited for you, though. I'm excited for you. I'm, like, clapping for you because this is going to be awesome. Matthew 1, <clears throat> let's start. Let's start in verse 18, though. Let's start in verse 18. God bless your word today. Let it pierce right through anything that might be trying to block, anything coming that, that might stand in the way of your word changing us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting in verse 18, Matthew 1. This is how. Somebody say, this is how. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. Let's stop for a second. Let's give it up for Joseph one time. Joseph, because everybody likes to, like, give Mary a lot of credit. Like, all the plays that I've ever been to for for. Christmas time, it's like Mary's up there, and she's like holding, holding baby Jesus. That's all you see is you see Mary, you see Jesus. But let's give it up for Joseph because, man, this is the guy who had to put up with basically the scorn of society. When he brought Mary home, man, that meant, that meant shame for him. In the eyes of the people around, this is what people don't realize. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, did not want to disgrace her publicly so he decided to break the engagement quietly someone say quietly 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 i'm gonna talk about that in a minute <clears throat> as he considered this oh i just wonder as he considered i just wonder how many um mistakes we could avoid in our lives if we would just stop and consider before we make a decision can i get an amen from somebody probably the person next to you really needed to hear that not you but the person next to you really needed to just hear that Stop and consider. I wonder if we would just stop and consider how much pain that we would avoid if we would just stop and consider. But as he was doing that, because as he was stopping to consider, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Say what? <laughs> Say what? That's crazy. Verse 21. She will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this. Somebody say all of this. All of the drama, all of the turmoil, all of the struggle, everything that they had to go through, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. It didn't say when he woke up, he felt really good about it. When he woke up, all of his fears were gone. When he woke up, he didn't have to deal with any more problems, any more struggle, or any more circumstances that were hard to go through. It didn't say any of that. What did it say? It said he did. He, he did what the Lord commanded. He was faithful to do and perform for an outcome he could not see. Mm. 
He acted in obedience. Let me tell you something. You don't have to feel something in order to have faith for something. That's a, I think we can be done. See you guys next week. No, I'm just playing. We're going to keep going because there's a lot more. There's a lot more. Let's actually go back to verse 19 really fast. Let's go back to verse 19 and see if you can find that. It says, because he was faithful to the law, because he was a righteous man, uh, he wanted to divorce her quietly. That's all right. You guys remember the, you guys remember the verse. Now, this is, I think this is the first little nugget that you guys need to have for Christmas this year is that, man, we need to keep it quiet sometimes, man, when, when all the in-laws come in town. Somebody say, keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. When, uh, when your spouse is yelling at you about to, you need to do something that you should have done one week ago, let me tell you something. You need to keep it quiet. Just keep it quiet. When the kids are yelling at you on Christmas morning because you got them the blue one, and they're saying, I wanted the red one. But you went to six stores to get the blue one. Somebody say, keep it quiet. Keep it quiet, keep it quiet for Christmas. That's the title of this message. No, it's not. No, it's not. Keep it quiet for Christmas. Keep me from killing a kid at Christmas, man. Because it gets crazy, man. Christmas is a little wild. Isn't it? Christmas can be a little wild. How many of you, maybe it's just me, but I think Christmas has gotten a little out of whack. I think Christmas is a little overrated. Wait, don't throw me out the church yet, everybody. I love Christmas. I love Christmas trees. I love baby Jesus. But. I think Christmas may have gotten a little uh, um, out of balance a little bit. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. Um, I, think, I think we do Christmas a disservice when we sanitize the story so much to where it doesn't even reflect what really happened and the way it really was. We're going to talk about that today. What about these songs, man? Silent Night. Silent Night. I've had three babies. There ain't nothing silent about it. You're going to tell me that Jesus, all God, all man, didn't have a little colic? All right, he was going to yell? Okay, let me tell you this way. All right, Joseph yelling at Mary, man, get up and get that baby, please. He's crying all night. I can't get any sleep. And Mary yelling at Joseph, me get that baby. Make me ride on that donkey all the way to Bethlehem and don't even have the sense enough to get a motel room ahead of time. You get up and get that baby. All is calm. What? What Christmas planet are you from? We do Christmas a disservice when we take the reality out of what Christmas really was. For real hope, we need real Christmas. We need real Christmas. And real Christmas comes from correct context. That's why the, title, my, the real title of my message is Context Changes Everything. And you're going to hear me say that word, context, about 14,000 times in this message. So just get ready for it right now. Context changes everything. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that we face. We have a scene in our mind about how things are supposed to go. We, we, we have this whole big play. We have this whole big scenario. And if people would just behave the way they're supposed to, then it could be the best Christmas ever. If, if, if she would just say what I know she should say, if, if Uncle Arthur wouldn't, would leave his booze at home before he comes over this year, if Aunt Mary would stop bringing over a different boyfriend every year, if they would just play along with the scene that I've created in my mind, then it could be the best Christmas ever. Not just Christmas, but your job would be perfect if they would just behave. If everyone would just do and say and behave the, one, the way that you want them to, what if, uh, what if your boss and your coworkers don't behave the way that you want them to, which they almost never do? Come on, let's be real. What do you do when there are empty seats at the Christmas table? And that is not the way you envisioned it at all. What happens when your ideology doesn't line up with reality? What happens when what, you've, what you're hoping for in your mind? It doesn't turn out to be the way it really is. That's hard. The Christmas story, the way it really happened, gives us hope. Not because all was calm, but because all was crazy. And that's the way the Savior came into the world, was through a bunch of crazy we got saved and salvation came to the whole world because Jesus came through a bunch of crazy madness. That's the real Christmas story. So when we sanitized it 
and try and come up with some hallmark version of Christmas, we lose being able to identify with what even Mary and Joseph had to go through during, but it was Christmas time. Yeah, especially during Christmas time. Isn't that right? Yeah, it is. When Joseph took Mary home, he took home criticism, scandal, with a, to be with a woman who had apparently been unfaithful to him, purely on faith. Somebody say, embrace it. You gotta embrace some things in your life. You've gotta embrace some things in order to get through them, struggle through them, power through them, because that's exactly what these folks had to do, and they had Jesus as an immediate relative. So do you. Joseph embraced a script he could not have imagined for his life, and that's what we can credit to him. So we have to do like Joseph did. <clears throat> we have to get correct context. Matthew, who wrote the first gospel, did us a big favor because in order to embrace the context, the chaos that can come from living in faith, you got to have it. you got to have correct contexts. That chunk of, you know that, that chunk of scripture I skipped that we didn't read in Matthew? You know, verse 1 through 17, because I didn't read that because you'd be so bored if I read that. It was begat, begat this person, begat that person, and then that was a father, that person, that was a father, that person. Let me tell you, that was exactly what Joseph and any other Jewish person would have needed to get some context on where Jesus was coming from. And because you skipped it, and most of us do in our Devo time, it's like, man, I don't need that. There's no Devo. There's no soap journaling I can do on that scripture, so I guess I'll skip it. Some of you don't know the real context of Christmas or the context of Christ because you may have corrupted context that says I have to be perfect, God is mad, do a couple Hail Marys and carry on. I think we're actually going to start selling shirts that say Hail Mary and carry on. Definitely not. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Bad joke. Elliot, come on. Dial it back a little bit. You know what? You know what? That's exactly, corrupted context is exactly how the devil introduced sin to the world. Did you know that? Did you know? That's, that's, even though the first sin was, was a root of pride where Satan was standing up here and he's like, yeah, I'm pretty bad. You know that? Yeah, I'm going to take some of that worship. I'm going to give it to me. That was the first one. And then the Bible says that, that the devil was cast down like lightning from heaven. He didn't last for even one second after that. But the way that Satan introduced sin to Adam and Eve was... Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? He's not very nice, is he? That's not what he said at all. That's not what he said at all. No, he said that you can eat from any tree. But if you eat from this one, it'll hurt you. So don't do it. And devil comes in, and what did he do? He wanted to corrupt the context so that he could kill now, I, I really tried to find three C words. Corrupted context kill. I had to use a K, so I had to make up for, for this. And you can write this down. The enemy wants to cancel your calling by corrupting your context. He's been doing it since the beginning of time. He's been doing it since the beginning of the world. He's been trying to corrupt your context, get you to see it differently, so that he can cancel out your calling and that's exactly what he did in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they had dominion, man. They had it all. But the serpent slipped in, corrupted the context, and took that dominion for himself. That's why we live in a broken world. That's why we live in a world with hurt and pain and sickness. It's because that happened. So what did Matthew do? He commenced his gospel with correct context. What's the context of Christ coming to the world? What's the Christmas context? King Herod was killing babies under two years old. Somebody say, Jesus didn't have any peers. Put that on a Christmas card. <laughs> man, not like, dang, man, kind of a downer here. Jesus was born into a world of violence. Go around caroling about that. Well, I mean, this is the real context of what was going on. Jesus was born in the hood. South Central Bethlehem with my mind on my minors and my minors on my mind. Oh, okay, so I got, because you got to be ghetto and Bible literate to get that joke. So I got a couple hybrids here today. I really appreciate that because mine is money, okay? It, and then Dr. Dre, just forget it. Just forget it. 
y'all don't, you don't get me. You don't get my context. You don't know what context I'm coming from and why I'm so excited to be here because it's a privilege. Jesus was born in a context that would make him disqualified in people's minds. Born of a virgin, first of all, how is that even possible? And if you take time to read for Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and look at his family line, you will catch the context that Jesus was born through a line of murderers, fugitives, liars, backstabbers, and if that weren't enough for you, he was born through a prostitute too. And so before you look down your nose at anybody this Christmas season doesn't have their act together, just know that Jesus was born through sinners, for sinners, and you're one of them. Somebody say, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. He came for me. And that's the context. That's how he came. That's exactly what he came to do. And that concludes my introduction. <laughs> oh my God. Don't worry. You'll be out of here on time. I got a wristwatch on. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. This begins. My first, my first point is this. My first point is this. Somebody set the timer on me for crying out loud. Point number one. This might be in your bulletin. It might not. We're, we've got a lot of changes, so I don't know what's going on these days. But write this down if you've got something to write with. Context brings commitment. Context brings commitment. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, King David is recorded as saying, I will not present burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, that have cost me nothing. I'm going to take it one step further. I'm going to take it one step further. Don't tell Jesus that I'm, that I'm messing up his Bible or anything. I'm going to take it one step further and say, if it didn't cost you anything, it's not an offering. If it didn't hurt, if you didn't sacrifice to give it, how does that make it even an offering? It's quiet, man. You guys are like, yeah, that's true. I guess he's right. That's why if you meet someone who is very committed and lives at a high capacity in their calling, you have to know there was a high cost associated with that. There was a lot of struggle that went alongside of that. When you meet somebody who is like living their best life now, who is doing really good in some area, you, you should just assume right off the bat, that person's been through some struggle. That person has pressed through some things. Because the most successful people I've ever met, I don't know about you, when I hear a little bit about their story, there's always a component of struggle. There's always a component of, of process because it's the process that produces the product. That's why you don't put miracle grow on grapes. They'll grow all right, but you don't want to eat those because they taste like, and they're bad for you. You have to let, there's a natural process. And the process produces the product. Let me tell you this way. I, um, I have a friend of mine um, who I, I met a couple years ago, and they're just they're doing humongous things as a pastor and doing great things, and I've just been spending a lot of time with this gentleman, and he's just made such an impact on my life. And so I, I go, I talk to him frequently, and I went, when I went and met him the first time, because he's a, he's a church leader, and so I, I just had to ask him, I'm like, man, what's the secret sauce, bro? How are you doing all of that? What is going on in your life that your ministry is like blowing up like that? And you know what he told me? He's like, we struggled, man. We struggled. There was a seven-year period where their church didn't grow one inch. Not a single, not in a single new family. <laughs> no newcomers. Like newcomers would come, but then they would go. And it's like seven years. And let me just tell you, you might not know what that feels like, but it feels like bad. It feels really bad. But he told me for seven years, and I, and I realized something, man. That process of struggle is what produced the product and that solid, firm foundation of I've been through something. It's like pushing on a boulder for years and years in your life. You're pushing on it, pushing on it, pushing on a wall. It just won't move. But by the time you get off of it, you got all these muscles. You're like, ugh, I'm strong. Didn't look like I moved anything, but I have grown. That's why in verse 18 of the scripture we just read, Matthew says, and this is how Jesus was born. He didn't come down on his perfection parachute. 
He didn't come down and, and go into a little glass box where nothing ever hurt him and nothing ever came his way. No, that's the context of real Christmas is that he had to go through struggle. If you get your theology on Christmas from the carols alone, you will miss the struggle and the turmoil and the doubt that Joseph faced. You will miss the pain and the persecution that Mary had to go through. All is calm. If you get your theology from that, and if we start to try and mirror our lives to, oh, I have to, be, I have to match myself up to look like this Hallmark card, then it's not going to work. You're going to always feel less than. You're going to always feel like you don't measure up. But you got to realize that the most successful people, the most committed people that you will ever meet went through more struggle than anybody else. I'm just going to say it outright. Some of you haven't struggled enough. That's why you haven't seen the success you want. I know it's hard. I know that's hard to hear, but, but some of us need to embrace some struggle. And we need to push. And I'm not talking about stress either, because Tiffany did a great job last week talking about stress and anxiety. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about struggle. I'm talking about discipline. I'm talking about perseverance. I'm talking about seeing a vision for your life and pressing through the challenges. Not just being like scared and anxious and stressed. I'm talking about struggle, push, fight. To struggle means to fight and grapple with something. Some of us need to up our struggle. We need to remember that the, the greatest struggle brings the greatest results in our lives. They were wrong to you. They did you wrong. But you're going to decide not to compromise your character to get back at them. That's struggle. That is what I'm talking about. You failed 10 times, times 10 times. Maybe you're like me, failed so many times. But I'm choosing to get back up, even though everybody's pointing and laughing at me, telling me I can't do it. I'm going to get back up anyway. That's struggle. That is the struggle we need to embrace. Maybe you feel lonely most nights, but you're not going to text that person or get on your computer screen because you're choosing to protect your purity. That's struggle. That's all right. You don't need to say amen to that one. Your struggle today is a setup for your success tomorrow. I hope you get that. Your struggle today is a setup for your success tomorrow. I hope some of you will embrace the struggle today. I hope some of you will struggle through some things today. I hope some of you will choose. I am going to push through, even though it has been seven years in the Bible. In the Bible, when Joseph was talking to Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of famine, followed by what? Come on, seasoned saints. Come on, come on. Anybody been at church for like 10 years or longer? What's it followed by? Seven years of plenty. Seven years of famine. If you can struggle through that, you're on your way to seven years of plenty. I hope you get that today. Str Jesus struggled through the cross before he sat down with the crown. Do we need another example? Do we need another illustration? Look at what Jesus did. He died on the cross, the worst kind of death he could possibly die. The struggle produces the outcome. And that leads me to my next point. Context brings celebration. Context brings celebration. And context can also help you understand someone else's celebration. Context can also help you understand someone else's celebration because King David, uh, also a lot of my illustrations are about David. He's one of my favorite guys in the Bible. Psalm 122, verse 1, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. He said, let's go to church. And he was coming in the door like this. I saw a couple of you doing the same. And I think I know why. Because David was chosen even though he was the least qualified among his brothers. He, David was victorious over a giant everyone said he couldn't beat. David was spared from an evil king's threats. Let me paraphrase that for today. He kept his job even though his boss was mean. Come on, somebody. He was forgiven for adultery and then murder. So, yeah, he was glad when he was able to go to church after that. Because he was he who is forgiven much. <laughs> I don't think you're getting this, so let me come at you another way. There are people who will be really happy this Christmas getting less than you got because their context is they've never had anything before. 
You see what I'm talking about? It's about context. It's about context. <laughs> How about these kids that were given gifts to this Christmas with incarcerated fathers? The ones that you ran back and you took all the names off the tree that we had to scramble to find some more names. You ran after them. Those kids will be weeping over the gifts you bought them. That some of our kids would walk past in the store without even noticing. Why? Context. Because my dad's in prison right now. And some church wanted to buy me a gift. Right? It's about context. So you can understand someone's celebration if you can understand their context and what they went through. The person sitting next to you today in church may have been a little more exuberant than you during worship. Maybe even a little loud, got their hands up a little bit. They did some of this, and even some of them start saying amen really loud next to you. But, and you're like, what the heck is going on with that? But maybe the person sitting next to you was a little like me. They didn't know if they would see their 25th birthday. But they, they're here by the grace of God, so don't be confused when someone next to you is engaging with me during the sermon or during worship because the person has had their life given back to them by the King of kings and the Lord of lords and has been caught up out of the slimy pit and had their feet set on solid ground, and they didn't know if they would see their 21st birthday and they're just glad not to be in prison right now. So yeah, don't slow them down even for a second when they start going, amen, even if there ain't words on the screen. I don't care. Make them my own words. Do you see what I'm talking about? Because some people, they just, I know where I was. I was dead, but God saved me. I was in a cell, but God saved me. I didn't deserve it, but God saved me. I messed up so badly, but God saved me. That's why I say amen. That's why I lift my hands up like that. I don't care what you look at me like. But when you understand someone's context, it helps you understand why they're celebrating like that. Because some of us, we've just been through a lot, you know, and we're just happy to be here. I'm just happy to be standing up here. I shouldn't be standing up here. You know, so I do have a background of, of, of jail and stuff, and I, I try not to use, like, all my illustrations like that because I want you guys to understand, but I just can't help myself. I didn't even write it in, but I can't help myself. I should know better by now. I've been doing this long enough. I should just move on, but I was in, I was in jail, and one of my friends was looking at a lot of years in prison. He was looking at, like, 25, and they say with an L, you know. 20, and he came, he came back from court, and he got sentenced, like, 15, 10 years, 15, I can't remember exactly. And everybody was like, yeah, high-fiving him. Celebrate. He got 10 years, but he was happy about it. Why? Because he shouldn't have ever been let out. I know some of you won't understand that, but I, 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 it helped me understand that even though you may be suffering through something right now, even though you might be struggling with something right now, you're still able to celebrate because you know your life should be so much worse. But it's not. It's good. Your life is good. You're sitting in a heated building right now, listening to a message, man. It's not like I shouldn't even be here. Tell somebody next to you, you don't know what it's like to be me. Tell them louder. You don't know the fights I had to fight. You don't know the fights I had to fight. You don't know the struggle I had to endure. You don't know that my life was hanging by a thread. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know what it cost me to be here. So don't even think about slowing me down when I feel like giving God some praise in his house. It's all about context. This next one, this next one is similar, but it's not the same. It says, context brings gratitude. Context brings gratitude. Maybe I have a sixth sense of humor, but when I think of gratitude, I think of John chapter 11. And I think of how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and, and he, he drug his feet. He was like, man, I'm going to get there when I get there. Man, I'm gonna, he's, but he's dead. Don't even trip. Man, I got this. I, when I think of gratitude, I think of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And in John chapter 12, they're sitting in Lazarus' house with, with Martha and Mary, let me ask you something. Do you think there was a long pause when Jesus asked someone to pray over the food? Lazarus was like, I'll pray. Yeah. Because I was dead. Remember? I'll, I'll pray. Oh, Lord, bless this food. Oh, it's going to be so good. Man, burnt turkey. And I'm like, yeah. Or do you think he was like, oh, 
turkey is so dry. <sighs> Green beans again. Martha! Martha! What's a guy got to do to get some wine around here? Come on. Do you think that was his attitude? No. <laughs> because he was dead and now he's alive. It's crazy. Context can bring gratitude. Even if you're stuck with all the, all the light-colored turkey. Man, you all know that's dry. It's dry. I don't care how you cooked it, man. It's always dry. But if you got, re if you got saved from death, man, right, give me all the white turkey, man. Green beans for every meal. I don't care. I don't care because I was dead. I was dead. And I made so many mistakes. I don't even deserve to be here. So give me green beans for every meal. I don't even care. He's screaming, I get to eat food. Is that, is that something you, you are grateful for on a regular basis? That you get to eat food? Context. Context. I was on a conference call recently. It was a couple weeks ago, and I was on a video conference call. I was in Stockton. I was in my little green wonder car that I love so much. I love that car. Somebody is like, if, if you haven't been here, I've been telling a lot of jokes about my hoopty ride, and it heard me and was like, Battery, radiator, pff, one week. I was like, I'm not telling any more jokes about my, so you hear me? You hear me, Hoopty? I'm, I love you. I love you. I was sitting in my awesome, highly favored car that I anoint with oil weekly, two or three quarts. And I was sitting, and I was sitting in a Food for Less parking lot in Stockton, um, and I was on this video conference call with, with several pastors up and down the West Coast. And we started going around in a circle, introducing ourselves and explaining our context. And so I went first, and I was like, man, my wife and I, we, we took over this existing church. This church has been here for like 75 years, something like that. And we, we got to come in, and it was going steady for a really long time. But this last year, we like doubled in growth, and we baptized like 33 people. And hundreds of people raised their hand for Jesus just this year not even counting today, and I was just like, so excited. We're all the way up to, I, I told him, it's like right around 150, and I was like, this is so, and we're so excited about it. And the next person goes, and, he, and he's probably my age, and he's explaining, he's like, yeah, you know, we planted a church uh, two years ago, and we had our launch team of seven leaders, and then we, we, we started going, and our launch day, we had 250 people, and then it went down to 70 and we were 70, and then it started going up, 80, 90, 100, 120, and, and I'm like, yeah, man, that's awesome, so we've leveled out around 120, and we're like, yes, that's so exciting, God is doing something amazing, and then this other lady went, it was her turn, I'm not going to say where she's from, but uh, she was like, you know, it's just been really hard, it's just been really tough, you know, um, we've just been leveled off at like 1,500 for so long, and it's just really a hard, it's just so tough where I live, you know? I'm like, 1,500, dude, you'd be like the mega church in Lodi, dude. Whoa, whoa. Why? Context. It's all about context. Gra How come me and this other guy were like so grateful that people are getting saved and new visitors every single week, and we're like right here, and we're so grateful, but someone else who has 10 times can be like, oh, man, it's so it's so hard. When is God going to do something for us? Context keep people from acting like jerks at restaurants when their order gets messed up. Because I have a news flash for you. If you rode in a car today, you're among the 20% most wealthy people in the world. And that whole restaurant thing, that's a pet peeve of mine. So you might hear me talk about it. Because I, I was a waiter for several years. And on Sundays, man, here they would roll up glowing from church. And they walk in like, I'm the king. I'm a son of the most high God, and their chest was out, I'm, I'm the king. And they would sit down, and they'd be like smiling for like 10 seconds, and then they'd look, where's my water? There is way too much ice. I would like, I would like a cup of coffee. And if it's not 130 degrees, I send it back. I'm like, man, what the? No, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do anything like that. But it is a little pet peeve of mine because context helps you be grateful. Even though they sent you the wrong thing, man, you can still be nice to that lady. You can still be nice to that fella who brought you your food. Come on, somebody. Please, please don't ever let me hear you, hear about you, 
about that because I may make an illustration out of you. Context helps you be grateful for your dead-end job because someone is going to be out of work this Christmas and they're thinking about ways they can do anything nice for their family. So when you walk into your dead-end job, you're like, high five, mean boss, I love you, (laughs) right? Context helps you love your crazy family. This Christmas, <laughs> somebody said, somebody elbowed the person next to you, don't, don't do that. When some people grew up not knowing who their mother and father was. Context helps you be kind and loving to your spouse when some people will be spending their first Christmas alone this year. Context helps you appreciate your crazy kids because this year some parents might not have their kids with them this Christmas. Context is the greatest gift we can receive because context brings compassion. Context brings compassion. Hebrews 4.15 says this. This high priest, talking about Jesus, he understands our weakness. He faced all the same things we do. In other words, he understands what you're going through right now. It's not like he's just nice about it. No, he understands because context brings compassion. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I are. That means the sexual stuff. That means the greed stuff. That means the pride stuff. He was tempted every way. So he doesn't just have compassion. He understands what it feels like to be tempted that way, yet without sin. He understands. He understands the persecution, the temptation, the struggle. You don't have to tell Jesus the struggle is real because he knows already. Come on, Jesus. Don't you see? He knows. He knows, but he doesn't just know. He cares. He cares. Some of us don't have compassion because we don't have context of the conflict some people are going through. Allow me to illustrate. Context is why... A white person, such as myself, can grow up thinking, oh, racism isn't a real thing. Racism doesn't happen anymore. They didn't make any of that, man. That's why someone like me can grow up thinking that way, because I don't have the context to understand what it feels like to be followed around in a store because of the color of my skin. If I've never been through it, it's hard for me to have compassion about it. Because I've never been through having to sit down with my child and explain to them how to deal with a police officer who pulls them over for a broken taillight. And how to be polite in that. If, I, if you don't understand, if I don't understand, and I can say that as a bleached white person, I can say that, all right? And, th- and I'll be honest with you, that was the way I grew up. Not, not practicing racism, but, but not understanding, not knowing that it's something that we, need to, that we need to fight against. It's something that we need to learn to have context for, that just because we've never been through it doesn't mean it's not real. Let me tell you something. That issue has been going on since the dawn of man. What makes you think it's over now? It's always been happening. Always people have been looked down on for one reason or another. But it's more than that. It's actually even more than just that. Context prevents people from understanding someone who's, who's lost everything and has ended up on the street because you've never been through something like that. You've never been through what it's like to be in a certain kind of job during a recession and lose everything, and then your wife leaves you, and then your, your child falls ill, and so you just cannot, you can't compute, and you just shut down, and now you're on the street and people kick dirt at you. When, when, when you can't understand what someone's been through, it's very hard to have compassion for someone in that context. But let me tell you something. Our context for compassion is that Jesus became human to face all of the struggles that every one of us face every day. He faced it. He faced it. And in that light, it brings me to my last point. Context brings change. Context brings change. We usually start with the theme verse for a series, but I thought I would end with it today. It was very appropriate to do so. So in Isaiah 43, starting in verse 18, I'm going to read out of the Message Bible. It says this, forget about what's happened. 
Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through the desert. The context is we all face deserts in our life. A desert is a dry season, a season where you don't feel like God is speaking to you at all, and he can't see you, he can't hear you. A desert is a dry place, a 360 view. You know, everywhere you look, it's dry. Let me tell you something. Every single one of us, even me, have been through a dry season, long dry season. And if you're not in one right now, you probably just went through one, or I got news for you, you're on your way to one, because <laughs> dry seasons happen. But God is screaming at us, I'm making a way in the desert. I'm bringing that living water through the desert. I want to refresh you in the desert, in the hard time, in the struggle that you're facing right now. He says, I want to bring you through it because I've made a way. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. And I don't want you to suffer just because you're in that desert doesn't mean I'm not with you. Just because you're going through that struggle doesn't mean I'm not with you. Just because you're going through the things you have to go through right now does not mean God doesn't love you. It does not mean God is not present. But in fact, God says through his word to you this, this morning, alert, be present. I'm about to do something. Don't you see it? I want you to look at this uh, photo uh, that I got right here. I got a little photo. I think it's going to be coming up pretty soon. Does he? Do you have? Give me a, he doesn't. Do you have it? Thumbs up, thumbs down. He said, he said, no, I don't have it. He said, no, I don't have it. Well, let me just explain it to you. There was an uh, internet sensation several years ago about an obviously gold and white dress. You remember that? Raise your hand if you remember what that is. I was going to show you. I was going to show you, but you'll have to just use your imagination. It was an obviously gold and white. Somebody said yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was an obviously white and gold dress that had bad lighting and looked blue. All right? You're wrong. You're wrong. If you think it's blue, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> so, but let me, th that, that whole thing, that whole thing just shows you how desperate we are for stuff to argue about. There must not have been an election coming up, so we had to find something to argue about. So let's put a dress on the internet and fight about it. Yeah, it's going to be great. But you know what that showed me? You know what that shows me? It shows me that you and me, you and me, you and me can look at the exact same situation and see something completely different. So what you and me and you and me need to do is we need to steep our context in God's word so that we can see what God sees for our life and not only look at the circumstances and the trials and the struggle, but learn to see our lives in God's context for us so we can see that God wants to bring life and life more abundantly. Can someone praise God in this place, please? Because God has rescued us and set our feet on solid ground and he wants you to see it that way. He wants you to see it that way, that you would just see that we are so, so broken, so undeserving. But God said, it doesn't matter what you deserve. I gave it all for you. I gave it all for you. God said, look, there is a way. I provided it in the correct context. We see our obstacles as opportunities to overcome. If you can just learn to see it God's way. If you see things in the correct context, we can see our problems as possibilities for God's provision. We can see our pain as a platform for God's power to be displayed because God wants to bring healing to that. We can see our doubts, even like in Joseph, for a delivery system for God's divine deliverance. That's exactly what the word of God teaches us. But can we learn to see it that way? In the correct context, we can see God's miraculous love overcome every mistake. If we can align our worries, our problems, our hurt, and our pain to the context of the cross, then we can have real commitment. We can have real celebration. We can have real gratitude and real compassion. And that's what God wants to bring to you today. That's the word of hope, encouragement, and love that no matter what you're going through this morning, no matter what you're going through this season, no matter what you've lost, God wants to bring something new. And God loves you. He loves you just the way you are. Just the way you are. But he wants to bring something new in this season. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I'm going to ask you to do something. 
I want you to ask the Holy Spirit in this quiet moment, nobody wrestling around too much. I hope you can stay for this. In the quiet and still of this moment, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? Just right under your breath. You don't have to disturb the person next to you. You can ask in the quiet of your own heart, God, what are you trying to say to me? What is the application today? God, what are you doing? What are you trying to do in my life? Heads down and eyes closed. I just know that there are some people here today that are ready to make a new commitment for Jesus. There, you might be here today and you've, you've never even heard about God talked about in this way, in this loving way that he loves you so much. He loves you just the way you are. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to bring something new into your life. Maybe you've never heard that message, that gospel message before, that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you personally, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life and a new life and a fresh start right here and right now. And some of you today, you, you used to have a relationship like that, but you've grown distant. Something happened where you were just far, you are, you are far from him now, that you used to be close, but you've just grown far. And I never want to discount that decision that some of you need to make that I used to be close to Jesus and I want to be close to him again and I want to recommit my life to him. Some of you want a new relationship with God and that is wonderful. I'm going to offer that in just a second. And anybody else who wants to recommit and reaffirm their relationship with Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment. I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as an indication to God and as an indication to me that you're ready to start a new relationship with him and you're ready to give your life to him. You're ready to, to say, Lord, here I am. You can have all of me. And if that's you today, just go ahead and lift your hand. One, two, three, lift your hand up high. You can do it. Be bold. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. And God sees you in this place. Yes, I see your hand. God is gonna make a new way in the desert. Anybody else wanna give their life to Jesus and make a new and fresh commitment? The Lord sees you. The Lord sees you. The Lord sees you. The Lord sees you. You can put your hands down and I want everyone to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and show me where to go. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Let's